Hi, EGP learners. Uh, let's take a look at a picture. Does anything look or sound familiar? Uh, Dr. Anne Example looked across the meeting room at Dr. Adam Fiction. Nice chap, talkative, lots of ideas, but why do I find him stressful to be around sometimes? She pondered as she tried to think how his idea would affect her specific plans. Adam paused for breath. Why doesn't Anne seem interested in my idea? Why is she always so critical? So, what's going on here? Hopefully by the end of this video, we will be able to help these two individuals to understand each other better and work together more effectively. Uh, Dr. Andy Foster here, welcome to EGP Learning Podblast and a vlog. Um, today we're going to be talking about personality typing and how it can be useful to help teams and individuals work more effectively together in organisations, uh, specifically healthcare organisations and UK general practice, which is where I have my experience. But I think a lot of people will find that the principles we cover today are applicable in their own um, environment and workplace and life. Uh, we will be focusing on using the Myers-Briggs type system. Uh, this is really widespread. It's a very popular, well-established system with lots of free supporting content on the web. Uh, lots of YouTube videos, lots of blog posts, lots of articles, lots of companies offering free tests, which is great. Um, at EGP Learning, we've been putting out a lot of content focusing on our interest in uh, the world of medical technology and particularly recently how that relates to the global crisis we're all experiencing uh, I'm filming this in spring, summer 2020. Uh, but we've had a lot of interest in the past in our productivity and personal and team management content. So hopefully this video will be an interesting change of pace and perhaps even give you and your team some resources to be more resilient at what is currently a difficult time. In this video, you will learn or be reminded about why investing in emotional intelligence and soft skills are important for yourself and your organization how to interpret a Myers-Briggs profile, what's the difference between an ENFP and an ISTJ, what did those letters mean? I'll give an introduction to that, um, why this might be useful for your organisation, for your practice. Uh, spoiler alert, there are applications in personal development, applications in managing and developing teams, and also specifically in preventing and resolving conflicts, uh, which a lot of organisations can struggle with. To explain all this, I'll be talking through a teaching session that I did in my practice. Uh, we'll be using that as the framework uh, with which to discuss all of these things in the presentation today. Uh, this should keep the whole thing real for you and show you how you might actually be able to do something useful with this knowledge in your workplace to include the, Im improve things. I'll link to a blog article I wrote in the show notes, uh, which has uh, these presentation slides that you'll see in the video um, in there so that you can perhaps go away and use those in uh, in your practice yourself if you so wish. So let's get started. As we all know, practices are under-resourced and under pressure, but the stakes are high and the decisions we make can have huge impact on our patients and also the staff and those working around us. In this type of environment, it's really easy for friction to develop between staff um, and a large amount of practice and organisational time can be spent and potentially wasted dealing with conflicts. Sometimes people can fall out dramatically with really, really destructive results. Uh, to increase effectiveness at work, we're all very used to investing ourselves and encouraging our team to invest in hard skills. So these are specific, teachable abilities, the things that can be defined, that can often be measured, um, such as how to process information, make decisions, um, acquire information, follow procedures, protocols, use equipment, use software. Um, these are all really, really important. And when considering aptitude for these skills, um, you often think in terms of uh, competence, IQ, capability. But there's a whole world of soft skills and they're really, really important too. And they're often a little easier to um, ignore and see as less important. So these are less tangible, harder to quantify, um, and include skills such as um, understanding motivations, those are our own motivations, those of colleagues, uh, listening properly, uh, the ability to um, engage in small talk, charm, build relationships. Uh, but these are so vital for individuals and teams to perform effectively. Um, and these skills make up our emotional intelligence. Um, so emotional intelligence, 
defined by Wikipedia, represents the capability of an individual to recognise their own and other people's emotions, to discern between different feelings and label them appropriately, to use this emotional information to guide their behaviour and to manage or adjust emotions to adapt environments or achieve one's goals. So hopefully we got that. Uh, so uh, raising emotional intelligence can in really improve the performance of individuals and teams, just like um, increasing hard skills can. Um, and an effective way of raising emotional intelligence is to um, give people the skill. So how white might we go about this? Um, personality profiling a GP practice. So this was a really interesting exercise we did a little bit of time ago uh, at my own practice. Uh, we designed and undertook a team building session based on the Myers-Briggs type indicator system. The aim of this was to um, help the team better understand each other's personalities, emotions, preferred ways of working, preferred ways of communicating and processing information. Um, there are many systems out there for understanding personality. Uh, Myers-Briggs uh, is just one of them, but it has the advantage of being supported, as we mentioned earlier, by a, a huge amount of entertaining free online content, videos, pictures, uh, posts, articles, free tests. Uh, there's really a whole sort of ecosystem out there. Um, Myers Briggs Touch Indicator, for those who are interested, was constructed by uh, Catherine Cooks Briggs and her daughter Isabel Myers Briggs, um, and it's based on some of the earlier work by Carl Jung. Um, for those of people interested in um, evidence-based and replicable results. Uh, personality profiling is a bit of a dark art um, and it's very difficult to reproduce and a lot of people will argue there's not much evidence based there and I consider it more of a reflective, qualitative um, skill rather than anything that is reproducible and quantifiable. Nonetheless, I think it's a really um, useful um, skill, concept and, and insight and way of looking at people in the world. So don't dismiss it just based on, on, on that really uh, watch the video and explore things um, so what did we do so all of the staff um, at the organisation so that's everybody from the students that were attached to us at the time uh, the office apprentice receptionists and you know all the way through the nurses salary GPs and partners took a Myers-Briggs type indicator test prior to attending a whole staff training session we use the 16personalities.com test. Um, this site is actually really, really uh, useful. Um, there's a huge amount of free content. It's written really well. There's amusing pictures. Really, really love it. Um, there's some paid for content uh, as well if you want to get a little bit deeper into some of the topics. But there's enough there to achieve a lot without having to pay anything. So it's a great site. Um, the Myers-Briggs type system describes 16 distinct personality types each represented by four letters. So these are the ENTJs, ENFPs. Um, these are describing 16 uh, different types. Each letter indicates which of two opposing preferences the individual favours in four different fields. There are no better or worse types of preferences in this system. Um, it takes all types of people to make a balanced team, a balanced society, uh, a balanced practice. Um, so our session included activities to explore these four pairs of preferences um, and we then mapped the personality types within the practice and finally we discussed how this new knowledge might help with personal development working effectively as a team and preventing and resolving conflicts so uh, the system is based around eight preferences structured across four um, fields energy information decisions and lifestyle uh, so to know someone's personality, uh, the MBTI, Myers-Briggs Type Indicator System, suggests that you need to understand how they manage their energy, so that's the energy dichotomy, how they acquire information, information dichotomy, how they weigh this information up to make decisions, and then how they prefer to take action in the world. And that's what this sort of lifestyle domain is, is, is really looking at. So the first exercise we did with people was to explore what we mean by preference because this isn't um, automatically obvious necessarily to people so we said right okay write your name with your preferred hand then write your name with your other hand and ask people to, to, to tell you to think about how that feels different and the sorts of things people tend to say is uh, it feels more natural with my with my preferred hand I don't need to think about it I don't need to expend effort 
um, I can do it better. With the offhand, people say, Actually, I really need to concentrate. It's difficult for me. It's a little bit stressful. It feels unnatural. I'd much prefer to just write it with the normal hand. So, so this is really what we mean by preferences when we're talking about these four fields. So that's a good initial exercise. Um, the next little exercise we asked the group to do was to explore the energy field, the energy dichotomy, um, uh, the differences between extroverts and introverts. So we said, right, everybody, stand up, stretch your legs. Let's move around a little bit. All of those who got an E on the test that you did before attending the session, go over to one side of the room. All of those who got an I, go over to the other side of the room. Um, and then we wanted to, as a group, discuss for a few minutes this question, what would make a good party? And um, then after a few minutes, ask them to to report back to the facilitator in the whole group. And the sort of answers that you, you hope you will get if, this is, if the session is working well is that the extroverts should be describing perhaps a bigger party, brasher party, um, inviting lots of people, perhaps people they don't already know but would like to know more, maybe celebrities, um, uh, things like that. Uh, and often you find that the introverts will be describing something smaller, um, often perhaps based around an activity rather than just a general mixer um, and perhaps with fewer people, people that they know well or have an existing or deep connection with. Um, so, so this is interesting and highlights the difference between those people with an extrovert preference and an introvert pressure preference. Extroverts would generally prefer to uh, initiate conversations, be expressive, um, engage in many different activities, enjoy a breadth of relationships and have a focus on the outside world. Introverts, on the other hand, uh, often will prefer to receive conversations, um, focus on fewer activities and prefer depth in relationships rather than quantity in lots of, lots of relationships um, and have more of an internal and reflective uh, focus in life. Uh, a popular analogy here is that extroverts are solar powered. They draw their energy from being active and engaged uh, with other people. So they get their energy from that engagement with other people, solar powered. The more the better. Introverts, on the other hand, um, are plugged in and battery powered. So they often uh, have to spend and expend energy when they're out with other people and they need to go home and uh, plug themselves into a, a power outlet or a book to recharge when their batteries are running low and actually find uh, those quieter, reflective activities actually where they get their energy. Uh, extroverts can often find those activities actually the draining ones. Uh, the next uh, field is that of uh, information gathering, sensing versus intuition. So, so this is where there's an S and there's an I, but it's confusing because we've already used I for introverts. So actually for intuitive, you use the N. So a big capital N in intuition. So for this one, we say, right, okay, you're going to move around again. And those people who've got an S are going to go over here. And those people who've got an N on the test will go over here. And we want you to look at the following picture just quickly for 45 seconds, write down or talk amongst yourselves or make a mental note of what you see. And we're going to ask you to describe the picture back to us. Um, and we used this picture, the Night Watch, uh, some Dutch masterpiece, isn't it? Really huge picture if you ever go and look at it. Um, and then when you come back to the group, the uh, the sort of expected answers again, if, the, if you're getting what you expect, um, then uh, the senses should be leaning more towards describing perhaps details within the picture. What time period does it depict? Um, how many people are there? Uh, talking about the objects, the costumes, um, things like that. Um, the intuitives uh, should be leaning more towards describing perhaps implied details. Uh, the men seem to be mustering, preparing for some sort of fight or conflict. There's a leader in the middle who's perhaps engaging them all in a rousing speech. Um, the more, um, not the details, the specific detail of it, but more what is implied, perhaps more the, the bigger picture. Um, so sensing types typically will prefer to deal with tangible, hard facts, focus on details, think more about the present um, and prefer practical, tried and tested solutions. Intuitive types will typically enjoy theories, look for concepts, patterns implicit in the facts rather than focusing necessarily on the facts themselves. And in fact, they can find the facts a little boring sometimes um, and sometimes to their detriment uh, and prefer to focus on the bigger picture, uh, focus on the future. They'll like to talk about possibilities, 
um, and might have a preference towards original and creative solutions rather than those that are tied and tried and tested. You'll notice a theme here that no one type is is better than the other. They've all got their roles, and I think either of them taken to an extreme uh, can be damaging. The next field is decision making. Uh, so this is where we have thinking versus feeling on the dichotomy. Uh, so the exercise we did to this was again, okay, move around. Uh, thinkers, T's, go to the left. Uh, feelers, F's, go to the right. Um, and discuss this question for me for a few minutes. What is conflict? And you can use any sort of you know abstract um, term really here to spark discussion. And then they'll come back with their answers. And uh, you hopefully will find that the thinkers are giving, um, or if they're acting to type, you will find the thinkers are perhaps giving more technical answers, perhaps trying to find an objective definition of conflict. Um, and the feelers might be giving you more examples, perhaps more anecdotes, uh, more of a person-focused um, answer, perhaps with an emphasis on achieving uh, resolution and harmony um, and how that might be achieved. Um, so that's the, the difference between uh, thinkers and feelers. Uh, so thinkers generally prefer to use objective, logical approaches, uh, value fairness through reason. So that's through reason. Um, focus on goals and end results uh, and see conflict as a natural part of communication. Uh, so often can be more direct um, and go to the facts, even if uh, that might cause a little bit of conflict. Uh, feelers, um, they say, will value subjective um, information and will seek fairness through compassion, through a more feeling approach rather than the reason of the thinkers. Um, they uh, are appreciative in their assessments and find conflict unsettling uh, and will seek to maintain uh, harmony more. Again, so they say, I'm sure there's exceptions uh, when you start typing people and looking at how they behave. But of course, these are just this is just a way of thinking about people and not everybody is going to fit in all of these boxes. Um, and as I was saying, it's important to remember that these are categories only represent preferences. Um, the approach that individuals are more comfortable with, perhaps more likely to do. Uh, but people can act out of type. It perhaps just takes a little bit more effort. Um, as we we're talking, it takes more effort to use your left hand. If you're right handed, you can do it. You can learn to do it really, really well. Uh, but it's not initially natural. It's something that you need to develop into. So thinkers do have feelings and they can definitely use those. Uh, feelers are perfectly capable of thinking things out in a logical manner and nobody's saying that they're not. Uh, this is just talking about those first go to preferences. Um, finally, there is the field of how do these people actually take action in the world? Um, judging versus perceiving. And I initially found this one a little bit more difficult to get my head around because what this dichotomy is actually driving at is how people act in the world and how they work towards goals. Whereas the language used judging and perceiving um, seems to speak more to decision making, but that's not really where this is driving. So the exercise, right? J's to the left, P's to the right. Um, and discuss this question for a few minutes. Uh, what would make a great holiday? And then people will come back. And um, if people are answering to type, you're judging types, um, will uh, be describing perhaps more specifics. So uh, particular plans, places, locations, itineraries, timings, uh, travel uh, plans, you know, all sorts of things, uh, you know, and how they're going to deploy and deliver that holiday uh, and specifically what they're going to get from it and why. Um, the perceiving types, may come back with uh, more open plans, something more flexible. Um, they'll be more adaptable to last minute changes, uh, more open to discoveries, spon spontaneous happenstance. Um, and you might get more of a general sense of what they want to um, achieve or experience with the holiday rather than the specifics of what they're doing. Um, and it's really interesting to see because uh, when you split people up in these dichotomies, you really do tend to get these sorts of answers, particularly as they're developing their answers in groups of people of a similar mind that really sort of um, accentuates the difference. So these are really fun exercises. So judging types prefer to make advanced plans. Um, 
itineraries, lists, schedules, value and methodological approach, um, and often actually seek to, to limit options and close decisions down. They like to have things decided early. So sometimes in a couple, when you're on holiday, you might find if, if one of you is a judging type and one of you is a perceiving type and you're thinking about uh, where to go for dinner, um, the perceiving type might constantly be on uh, TripAdvisor and constantly throwing up new possibilities. And Oh, how about this one around the corner? Oh, and this one and this one. Um, and the judging type just wants to, to get it settled and just say, right, okay, why not that first, second or third one? Let's just go for it. Speaking from personal experience here, but that's um, a really good example, I think, of the difference between judging and, uh, and, and perceiving. And remember, this is about how to take action in the world and achieve things rather than the actual decision making progress or process. So having gone through that exercise, we can then ask everybody, right, so, so who are you? Um, did anyone stay with the same person through the whole exercise? That's really interesting when that happens because they're likely to be the, the same one of 16 personality types and might share a lot in common in terms of um, how they interact and experience the world. Um, let people reflect back, share their insights on how they found that whole experience. Um, actually, you often get some really powerful and interesting insights from the team. Um, let some people talk about the profile that they've got and hopefully read uh, before coming. How do they feel about it? Is it accurate? Did they have any reflections? Um, and it's also interesting to invite the group to reflect on uh, group dynamics. Uh, was there any one person who seemed quite isolated to be separate from the pack on all four or any one of those um, things? Because that's something that it's really helpful for the group to be aware of. If everybody is extroverted and there's just one or a small number of introverts, that, that person might struggle or they might have been struggling. And hopefully that illustrates to people why that might have been the case and people can adapt. Um, so people will end up with their four letters and these refer to one of four personality types. And I'm just bringing up some images from 16personalities.com uh, on the screen because um, I really like their resources and their uh, their graphical style is really good. Um, so what we did, we did was we had a big poster and we asked people to go and write their name on the chart next to their personality type. Um, and we saved this and we displayed it um, and, uh, and uh, signposted people to it as a resource for if they were having um, something wasn't feeling quite right with their interactions with certain people, they could just, you know, reflect on their personality type, the, the other person's personality type and use what they'd learned to explore um, why that might be. Um, there's loads and loads of resources out there uh, based around the Myers-Briggs type personality. So uh, people profile famous people, people do profiles about TV shows and films, uh, Harry Potter, Game of Thrones. So it can be really fun. There's an element of it being like horoscopes, but these things you can use to really get your team engaged with it. And they're actually quite engaging for yourself and really quite interesting. Um, so how can this be helpful in, um, in a GP practice? So first of all, there's obviously much more uh, to person personality development, teamwork and conflict management uh, than this, but where personality is a factor, these are good places to start when thinking about how to apply uh, Myers-Briggs type um, uh, typing to your practice. There's lots of other things as well. And, you know, if this video is popular in future videos, we might explore how this could be used when interacting with patients, uh, when engaging with other stakeholders outside of the practice, if you've got proposals, um, you know, because you can uh, use this in all sorts of diverse ways to um, influence people, um, recognize um, things about yourself, you know, and get the best outcomes in all sorts of situations. But specifically, and as part of the session we did, we talked about um, personality development. And we talked we talk broad that you can go really deep on this, um, uh, particularly if you look into your own uh, profile and read about it. Um, but broadly speaking, um, you can use this to identify your strengths. Your preferences are generally where you're going to be stronger. Uh, and with knowledge of their type, staff can choose to focus on activities and roles that speak towards their natural preferences and strengths. Um, this is where they're more likely to excel and feel rewarded. So for example, an INTJ or architect type, uh, they might gravitate towards more strategic and planning roles, might be less concerned with actually delivering the nitty gritty detail of things. ESFPs, or known as the entertainer type on 16 personalities, they might uh, predict that they would feel fulfilled and have success where 
we're dealing with the groups of people and we're winning over support and coordinating people are important because that's where their skills lie. Um, also, it can give people an awareness of their weaknesses. So knowing where your blind spots are uh, is a really uh, useful um, insight. Um, so sensing types, they need to be sure not to get lost in the detail and to keep an eye on the bigger picture. Um, but conversely, intuitives, they've got to remember not to neglect the details of, uh, of, of, uh, of situations um, and tasks. And that's where they can sometimes become unstuck, uh, spending too much time and energy focusing on bigger picture and strategy. Um, so these are just some examples, um, but personal reflection from individuals can be really, really powerful on this topic um, and uh, it can give people a lot of valuable insights. So it's, it's helpful to encourage that and just remind them there's a lot of material out there on the internet if they just start looking and using Google and YouTube. Um, the other area is, is managing teams. So we'll get on to conflict resolution in a second, but just, just, just managing teams from a forming team perspective. So when you're creating your teams or forming new teams, you know, knowledge of the personality types um, of, uh, of staff can really help leaders um, identify those people who might um, be good at certain tasks and find enjoyment in them. And you can use this when you're forming a team or when you're recruiting in additional team members as well. Uh, for example, the reception team might benefit from being more extroverted perceiving types. Uh, they might be able to, um, to feel more natural handling direct patient contact and the unpredictability that that, that can flow up. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, an admin team weighted towards more you know, introverted um, sensing types uh, might be more suitable for their you know, more individual and detailed work and find that rewarding and not be looking for human interaction that they might better be finding on, on reception. Um, the other side is so to be aware of yet yeah, personal blind spots, but also team blind spots because teams are... Um, obviously groups as individuals and if certain uh, personality types are underrepresented that can be problematic so um, I'd read about uh, an American case study um, I say American because there's a sort of commercial element to it but about a dental practice and this partnership uh, had a really good reputation for doing technical work great technical work um, but their business was underperforming uh, and they sought advice about this um, and they got a consultant in uh, who did some personality typing and they found that the partners were exclusively introverted sensing types. So not outgoing and engaging with the outside world, outside the practice, uh, a very detailed focus. Um, and they actually used this information and this knowledge of their blind spot uh, to actually recruit an extroverted intuitive manager uh, to support their team. And in order to improve the team's ability to network with partner organizations um, and innovate new ways of attracting business and um, and apparently their business improved no end um, so uh, sometimes it's not possible to recruit to fill a blind spot you might not be recruiting at that point in time but just identifying these blind spots you can give certain individuals permission to play you know play up as those missing roles and you know actively think right what what would um, an intuitive be thinking right now uh, if everybody's sensing you know if you have an awareness you can you can do that so um, uh, just interesting to flash up um, a, a chart showing the representation of the different types uh, at my practice at that point in time when we did the exercise. So the uh, the two people who are thinking types need to watch out because it's a feeling practice. Um, so that was a really interesting um, insight and was quite amusing to reflect on. Finally, let's talk about um, managing uh, differences and, and, and conflict within the organization and also not just conflict management but but preventing conflicts so in life uh, most people have learned to be sophisticated operators and under normal low stress circumstances they will moderate their behavior uh, and they'll contain any extreme traits they'll compensate for blind spots you know we're all adults we've all uh, learned a lot of this stuff naturally already however when people are in stressful situations and often the NHS can be, healthcare environments can be, a lot of other business and corporate and family environments can be. Uh, you'll find people tend to fall back on their preferred ways of operating if they're under stress, if they're energy levels, you need energy to operate outside your preferences. And if those are low, people fall back on their preferred ways of operating. And also people's tolerance of difference reduces. So people's um, willingness to accept other people's other preferences is reduced, particularly if you're not aware of what's going on. And in this uh, sort of environment, 
uh, stock personality differences can be um, a recipe for conflict. Um, how can personality type knowledge help? Well, I think particularly if you've done it with the whole team, it gives everybody uh, a common natural uh, language and vocabulary to think about the differences, reflect on them, um, and also communicate with each other about them in a neutral way. So people actually having done this sort of exercise have the ability to say, oh, wait, something's not right here. And, you know, I wonder if it's because you're um, an extroverted person, you know, and I'm an introverted person. And, and that's why sometimes, um, you know, I need a little bit more space. You know, you can actually have conversations in a way that's neutral. It gives people the language and the ability to do that, which I think is really um, empowering and, and often um, you might find that people use these things to um, to manage their relationships proactively to prevent any conflict occurring and also um, can um, stop take stock and, and think about what's wrong in the early stages of a conflict and stop it getting any worse uh, where conflicts escalate and you need to mediate a, 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 and do some conflict resolution uh, the shared language can still be useful to facilitate between people uh, and encourage them to gain a new understanding and em empathy between each other and the different parties. Um, and you can also use this to suggest solutions. So, okay, this person's introverted, this person's extroverted. You don't, you don't need to go in and, and, and stand in their room and, and, and talk to them about, um, a, a, about um, you know, issues or ideas that you've got. You know, you can back off or you know, um, respect their, their space. You know, you could just um, come up with really practical solutions and it's a neutral way of talking about them. Um, so I'm going to finish there for today. Um, and just to recap, um, so how to implement um, a Myers-Briggs type indicator session for your whole team uh, and make it really beneficial. So let's just go through the tick box. So first of all, involve everybody. Don't leave every, anyone out. It's quite interesting anyway. So even if you've got students with you, um, you know, involve them. They will find it interesting and useful. Uh, people will have to do a little bit of homework beforehand. Um, so you need to communicate what, okay, what is this session about? Make sure they understand they're going to get value from it and ask them to do the homework. So we loved the 16personalities.com site. There's a really nice test that's long enough to be detailed and feel like you're getting value from it. But it's not too long. It's quite fun to complete. And there's lots of good descriptions of types and um, the different personalities on there that people can start to read before they come to the session. Um, be upfront about the aims of the exercise. People can sometimes worry about personality profiling and think that there's some sort of um, sinister intention um, at play. Um, but just let them know that the aim is just to raise the emotional intelligence of the organization, have a fun session, make everybody happier and more effective at work. Um, it's a bit like horoscopes, you know, um, if you've pitched in that way, people often I love it. Office people love horoscopes, I find. Um, be clear that the Myers-Briggs type indicator is a neutral system. There's no good or bad personalities. You need all the different types to make a healthy organization work effectively. Uh, so answer your quiz honestly. Um, there's no bad answers. Um, Use an informed facilitator. So naturally, this session will run best if the leader is familiar with the material and concepts. So uh, I read an excellent book. And again, I think we'll link to that below. Highly recommended uh, Type Talk. Really enjoyed it. Um, and I'd become a little bit of an enthusiastic amateur before delivering the session. And I knew the team quite well. So they were happy to listen to me. Uh, but you could consider bringing in someone from the outside, uh, outside of the practice uh, to do this sort of work with you. Um, Plan the exercise and presentation well beforehand. Uh, just mentioning that because I'll link to the blog post below. And within that, um, there is a PowerPoint slide that you might use as the basis of your presentation, if you so wish. Happy for you to do that. Um, follow up. And, uh, you know, a good way of doing this is to display the results. Um, sometimes people put these in their, in their email footers I've seen. Um, or people display them in their workplace so that people, when they're in their space can see it and know what type they are. Um, uh, but something to maintain the visibility of, of people's types is really helpful. I mean, we just had a chart on the wall that people can refer to. Um, signpost to all of the great Myers-Briggs type indicator resources out there on the internet. I encourage people to Google, YouTube, read all the stuff out there. Um, and also, you know, use the results yourself, actively manage yourself. Um, it'll increase your ability to manage your staff and your teams and conflict more effectively. Hopefully you guys found this session um, 
really helpful. As you can see, I'm quite enthusiastic about it. Um, there's lots more that we could actually talk about, you know, how to use this in the consultation, how to use this in more detail for, personality, uh, for personal development, um, conflict resolution, um, team development, um, how to influence, um, you know, all sorts of things. And if people want to do more sessions on this or want me to produce that, then, you know, mention in the comment below or message me uh, on Twitter at D-R-A-W Foster, Dr. A-W Foster on Twitter. Um, it's been fantastic talking to you about this today. Um, lots and lots of really great resources on EGP Learning um, on the YouTube channel, on the blog. Uh, so please continue to interact with myself and Gandhi, and hopefully I will see you again soon. Uh, thanks and have a great day. Bye bye. <laughs>